Well, it's good to be here. Uh, before I kind of get into our, uh, our study, uh, let me just uh, say a couple things. Uh, first off, I love your facility here. Man, it looks great. A um, little bit of history. Uh, I, I have been at the convention for almost 24 years now. Um, have been executive director for the last three years, and so I went in 2000 on convention staff. But prior to that, I served for 13 years at Pleasant View Baptist in Derby. And so I've got a history of this area. Obviously, I, I see familiar faces around here, the Spires and Cecilia, and some of, some of you that were a part of our church there. And it's, it's good to see uh, Stan and Kay Jones. Stan and, and Kay were in, in Topeka, some too, and um, long history with Stan, decades actually in ministry together, friendship and ministry. And so uh, it, it's good to be a part of this. And, and thank you, uh, Jason, uh, Pastor, um, Dave, Cameron, all your staff, we, we love what you're doing. And we want to say thank you, too. Uh, thank you for partnering in uh, missions uh, across Kansas, Nebraska, and around the world. Uh, your church is faithful in, in giving, and, and we, just, we thank you for what you've done. Quick report on that, uh, because I just shared this with the Executive Committee and Mission Board last week. Uh, from, from 2021 to 2022, across Kansas, Nebraska... We had an increase of baptisms of 160% across the two states. Yeah, yeah, that's something to clap for. So uh, consequently, part of that is obviously uh, more focus on baptism, as you guys are. But also, we are more intentional about getting uh, accurate records. And so we, uh, last year and, and again this year, um, following up on churches on the annual church profile to get those records from them. We had 95% last year, and we're about uh, close to that this year, too. Uh, so we're in the, in the midst of doing 2023. Now, uh, Dave mentioned Church Forward. Some of you may be thinking, what is Church Forward? Well, you know that we're Kansas, Nebraska Convention of Southern Baptists. Uh, I always use the, the tell the story, and, and uh, where's Kevin? Kevin, raise your, raise your hand. Kevin Fersel is on our staff, too. Kevin is going to be uh, working with worship team some, with Dave later. Kevin is our director of communication and worship, but Kevin also grew up at Pleasant View Derby. Those of you that know the church there, his mom, Susan Fersel, was our church pianist and still is there. Uh, and so her, his folks were a great part of our ministry there. Kevin's heard this story a thousand times, and he's going to hear it again. But often, I have to fly in the convention when I'm going to meetings. And you, if you're sitting by somebody, inevitably, somebody's going to ask you uh, what your name is, what you do, and where you work. And so my response was, well, I'm David Manor. I'm the executive director of Kansas, Nebraska Convention of Southern Baptists. Well, if you're on a plane and people hear that much information, they already have their earbuds in and they've moved on to something else. Now, that's not the reason we changed or rebranded, but we went through a, like a three-year uh, long process of kind of rethinking and reimagining uh, what we do as a convention and how we relate to our churches, which are churches like yours. And so th as a part of that process, our staff read together a book and, and the focus of that book is how to build your story brand. And, and really the thesis of the book is this. Uh, who is the hero of your story? And that hero then should be reflect, reflected in how you brand yourself out uh, in public. And so we didn't want the hero of our story. And we all know that Kansas Nebraska Convention of Southern Baptists are the 450 churches across our two states. But if you're talking to somebody that doesn't know that, they assume then that that is the office in Topeka or Webster Conference Center in Salina, uh, that that's what we're talking about. But the hero of our story as a convention is the local church. That's why we rebranded as Church Forward with the intent of the understanding that we've got three major initiatives, serving churches, propelling leaders, and maximizing those partnerships and relationships with churches with other entities, with our national organizations, and things like that. So you'll see uh, Church Forward on a lot of stuff that we send out. We, are still, we haven't changed our name, but that's how we're actually presenting ourselves because we want to focus on churches and our leaders, if that makes sense. Well, uh, I want to talk about worship, and this is something, obviously, 
Uh, if you know me and my background, my history was worship leadership for two decades before I went to the convention office. And, and when I went to the convention, my role there was actually director of worship and administration. And then that kind of transitioned through the years. But I've continued to teach and write in that area. So I have a real heart and, and, and love for worship understanding. And sometimes when you talk about a theology of worship, uh, that seems kind of a little too academic. And so the subtitle of this is Worship is More Than a Feeling. Okay? Um, so I guess that's kind of going to be the premise. And we're going to look at a, a scripture passage that I think is going to be foundation for this too. Before we get into that, there was a documentary that came out a number of years ago, obviously when Mother Teresa was still alive, uh, the, uh, a priest that had known Mother Teresa from her early years of being a nun before she became known as Mother Teresa. And they were interviewing him and saying, you know, why did she go to Calcutta? And they assumed when they were asking her this, that she was moved by the plight of the people in Calcutta. And that, that's the reason that she went there. So, so those feelings that were stirred by those people that were hurting is the reason she went to Calcutta. And this priest that was being interviewed said, no, that's not it. It, it wasn't because she had these feelings for these people. It's because she loved God. And consequently, because she loved God... That caused her then to go, to go to Calcutta. So he continued by saying, worship changed her. And then the consequences changed the world. It, it's because she loved God that she responded the way she did. Sometimes I think we, we, we uh, erroneously uh, make music and worship completely synonymous with each other. And I hope as I talk tonight, you'll realize as I talk about worship... Music is a part of that. It, it is, it is a, a, a voice that God has given us, a, a gift that God has given us to use, to, to honor and praise Him. Music is a part of that, but music is only a small part of worship. There's so many other elements to that beyond just music. In Mark chapter 12, there's a passage we're going to look at, beginning in verse 28. If you have your Bibles, you can turn along. We're going to just primarily look at four verses in Mark chapter 12. Beginning with verse 28. In Mark 12, the chief priests and elders knew uh, often when Jesus was talking about things, he was referring to them. In fact, often they were looking for a way to catch Jesus by what he would say. And so sometimes they would even try to bait him. And if you remember, there, there are some stories when the, the uh, religious leaders and the Pharisees would even get Jesus to try to perform miracles on command. And so they're always trying to catch Jesus at doing something, which is the story in Mark chapter 12. Their hope was that Jesus would say something treasonous, and so consequently, that would give them a reason to arrest him, which brings us to the question that's recorded in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 and 31. We're going to look at the first two verses, and then we'll jump to the second in just a moment. Verse 28 says this, one of the scribes approached And when he heard them debating, meaning the religious leaders and Jesus debating, and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command is the most important of all? Verse 29, Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, we'll look at the last two verses in just a second. Before we do, though, Jesus responded to this question from these religious leaders, these Jewish religious leaders, with the beginning words of the Shema. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They were trying to catch Jesus saying something treasonous. And in that moment, I can imagine that Jesus immediately had those religious leaders in the palm of his hand. Because the Shema was foundational to the prayer life of that Jewish culture. In fact, the Shema was so important to them that they would actually teach that to their children. That was like the first prayer that their kids would learn, much like we teach our kids to pray before they go to sleep at night. The Jews believed that they would try to say the Shema as the last words of their lives. And they would say that that memorized Shema in the morning and at night before they would go to bed. It was so sacred to them that sometimes they would even cover their eyes with their right hands in an act of humility as they quoted those words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
So Jesus responded to them trying to catch him by beginning the words of the Shema. The Shema states, as you, if you read the whole thing, that God is one and that we should love him with all of our being. And we should not only love him with all of our being, but we should also teach this to the next generation. That's why they taught their kids the Shema. In fact, if you look at Psalm 145, verses 1 through 4, it kind of parallels this. And the text says this, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Don't miss verse 4. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. So it's the duty of every generation of followers of Christ to see to it that the next generation hears the mighty acts of God and then responds to those mighty acts in worship. One of the ways we proclaim those mighty acts is through singing. As a congregation, but it is not the only way. And I would say sometimes, many times, it's not even the primary way. Because I think sometimes we've elevated music even above scripture and prayer and some of those other elements. Now it doesn't, that text doesn't just say one generation shall teach another generation how to worship. It states one generation shall praise his works to another. Indicating that one generation is constantly modeling for those generations behind us what it means to worship in spirit and truth. My dad was a terrible singer. He was awful. He, he passed away about three years ago. I'll tell another story about my dad in just a few minutes. My dad was just, you know, he just really was a bad singer. And my mom had a beautiful voice. I think that's where I got my talent. My sister could sing. My dad, uh, it was painful, actually. In fact, as I was growing up, and I would stand next to my dad in, as, a, as a young kid and a teenager, I was actually kind of embarrassed because my dad sang so badly and loudly. <laughs> he, he didn't hold back. But now as a, an adult, I realize more and more that it wasn't for me he was singing. And that melody that he was not close to <laughs> was this sweet melody, uh, and it was music to the ears of the Father. Amen. So it, was, it really was a joyful noise. <laughs> and now I think how my dad modeled for me what it means to worship in spirit and truth. I, I had a, a friend in seminary, one of the professors in seminary that used to talk about um, singing, how important singing is in worship, and, and how you don't have to have a, a musical talent to actually sing. And his, his saying was, if you can sing, meaning physically, you, you have a voice, not that you can actually carry a tune, but he said, if, if you can sing and don't sing, you should be sent to sing, sing until you do sing. <laughs> now, those of you that are in this section, that's a prison, if you didn't know, <laughs> called Sing Sing. So, so Jesus responded then, and, and to that answer to that question, he began with an answer uh, with one that we should also owe to, that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That should be foundation for our worship. He continued in verse 30. Uh, the text continues there in verse 30. And here's how Jesus answered. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater command than these. So Jesus challenged those he was teaching with, with five things that I think can, can serve as a foundation for our worship understanding that I'm going to land on, on tonight too. That serve as a challenge to us as we understand theologically, meaning the understanding of God, um, how to worship in spirit and in truth. And not only do it well ourselves, but model and lead others to do it too. So here's the first one from that text. Jesus said that worship means we love God with all our heart. We love God with all our heart. See, the heart is the, the symbol of our emotions or how we feel. So we, we love God with all of our heart. 
When we have a, a relational breakup, we often say that our heart is broken. Or when we are grieving, we often say our heart is heavy. Or maybe when we are happy, we often say our heart is full. In fact, though, worship that's just contingent on a musical experience that just stirs those feelings may not be worship, but instead it might be nostalgia. So think about this. Nostalgia is that sentimental remembrance of of something that occurred in the past, usually a, a happy, meaningful recollection of something in the past. And so that nostalgia is stirred by by something when that actually occurs. So nostalgia, when it comes to worship, can cause us then to romanticize or idealize or even embellish past worship experiences. So when we gather in worship together as a congregation, if those past worship experiences are not elicited because we don't know or particularly like the songs that day, We can leave the worship service believing worship couldn't and didn't occur. As a result, we sometimes then, as a a church, and I'm I'm speaking of the church in general, not just First Baptist. We sometimes attempt to then recreate those divine moments or events or entire seasons based almost completely on those, those feelings that were originally stirred And we call it worship when in essence it may be actually nostalgia. And also, beyond nostalgia, if our our worship is just based on feelings, then also novelty is a danger. Novelty is that quality of being new or original or, or unusual just to be new or original or unusual. So a, a college freshman, uh, alone for the first time, being away from home, it's a novelty for that freshman to, to be away from home and be on his own for the first time until he has to do laundry for the first time. <laughs> or like that, your child's birthday party. That, you, that, that little girl has that birthday party and she opens that present. It's the best present ever until she opens the next one. And so it's that understanding of, of novelty. Novelty, when it comes to worship, <clears throat> can cause us as worship leaders to over-innovate and over-stimulate and over-even imitate something we've seen out there. And each Sunday then can become uh, an exercise in surpassing or trying to surpass the creativity of the previous Sunday. We have to be more creative than we were the week before. And so when excessive worship novelty occurs, our focus then is often more on the creative than the creator. Worship is indeed emotional, but it's more than just a feeling worked up by what we sing or play. Then Jesus talks about the the second point that he makes, and it, it parallels that first one, that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart. We should also love the Lord our God with all our soul. So worship means that we love God with all of our souls. Loving God with all our soul means that worship occurs from the inside out. So our soul then reflects our relationship with Jesus. So don't miss this. Worship is not our attempts to be with Jesus. It's our response to having already been with Jesus. Loving God with all our soul is not something that occurs by what we do, but it's who we are in response to who God is and what he's already done in our lives. So true worship doesn't begin with our worship actions. True worship begins in the depth of our soul on the inside. And then it's it's expressed externally in our worship actions. Sometimes we invert that. Sometimes we get that backwards. Then when we, we start depending on what our worship leaders do on a giving Sunday to determine if worship can or can't occur. It's that understanding of cause and effect. Cause and effect is that that relationship when a a person, action, or thing makes another thing or action or event occur. Cause, effect. So a cause must always precede an effect. Now stay with me because this will be a point here. God's revelation is the cause. 
That's when he offers us a, a glimpse of his activity and his will and his attributes and his judgment, uh, his discipline sometimes, his comfort, his encouragement, his hope, his promises. When he gives us a glimpse of those things, that's the cause. Our response then is the effect. That's that sometimes planned and sometimes uh, uh, spontaneous reply to that revelation of God that we call worship. There's many models in Scripture of this cause and effect. Isaiah chapter 6 is one of those prime examples. In Isaiah chapter 6, the text says that, that Isaiah is standing in the presence of the Lord. and He's so overcome with God's presence that he, he just can't look up. In fact, he even says in that moment, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. So the cause of that was not Isaiah. The cause was the presence of God. And Isaiah's response, the effect, was, woe is me, I'm undone. The other cause, then, in Isaiah's life, too, is his worship response. When he was in the presence of God, he said, because he was in his presence, God, here am I, send me. God caused that. Isaiah's response, then, was worship, service. So what, don't miss this part, what we sing or play or how we sing it or play it can't cause a response because it is the response. So as good as our various worship actions are, as good as your worship team is, and they are, as good as those various worship actions are or may have been, they still can't cause worship to occur because those worship actions are actually the effect. Now, this is huge for the future. This should take the pressure off the worship team every Sunday to create worship for it to occur. And it should also remove those expectations that if we didn't know the music or like the music, it didn't allow somebody to actually worship. So those worship actions and our worship leadership, now they may prompt and remind and exhort and encourage more effect, or, but they can't cause cause. We can acknowledge that cause, but we can't generate it. And we can respond to that cause, but we can't initiate it. And we can celebrate that cause, but we can't create it. Scripture says this, He, God, has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light that we may do what? Declare His praises. He calls, we declare His praises. Cause, effect. The Father is seeking, meaning He initiates those, the kind of worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. That means He is waiting, longing, looking for us to respond to His revelation. He's waiting for us here. He's calling us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When I was a, a child, my uh, family lived in Tennessee. My, my dad's side of the family lived in Tennessee. And so each year, once or twice a year, we would drive from southern Oklahoma in that 1960 white station wagon um, from Ardmore, Oklahoma to Milan, Tennessee. It seemed like it took forever, and it did. Because we didn't have interstates then, and we were you know, two-lane highways uh, to get there. And it seemed like it just took forever. My sister and I uh, had to split the back seat. If you had kids, you know what I'm talking about there, that we each had a side. And we would get there, and it seemed like it took forever to get there. And we were so excited to see grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles. And my, my grandparents lived on a farm outside of Milan, Tennessee. And when you would, would turn the corner on their road, and actually in Milan, Tennessee... Uh, that road became uh, incorporated into the city, and it's still called Manor Frank Road, where my grandparents actually live in Milan, Tennessee. You turn that corner at the bottom of the hill, you can see my grandparents' farmhouse. Obviously, students, this is way before cell phones. So they had no clue what time we were going to arrive. They just knew we were coming that day sometime, and then we had a long, long drive to get there. But one thing we could count on was as we were around that corner, and we could see the farmhouse and get a little bit closer was my grandmother sitting in the porch swing waiting for us. She'd been there for hours. She was looking, longing, excited about us showing up. So then how arrogant, and we bring that back to that worship understanding, how arrogant is it for us to have assumed that what we sing or how we sing or, uh, or don't sing determines whether God shows up or not. 
He's here long before we got here. His presence is here waiting, longing, looking for us to acknowledge him. Third thing that Jesus says this. Worship means we love God with all of our minds. <clears throat> we love God with all of our minds. Scripture says this. Study to show yourselves approved unto God. Study to show yourselves approved unto God. Uh, sometimes as church members, and, and I, I'll count myself in this, we often wait for the first song to occur to engage in worship. But worship requires more than just an emotional response that we've talked about. It also requires mental preparation. Yes, that's right. Loving God and loving others is continuous. Harold Best actually said this. Worship is continuous just depending on whom or what you're worshiping. So it's continuous. So if it's continuous, it's going to require us to think about it and consider it and process it and meditate on it, study it, and learn how to get better at it. In his letter to the church at, at Philippi, Paul exhorted them with this. He said that whatever is true and whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, and, and I don't know that this is true, but I can imagine Paul started to think of the list is getting long. So finally he just said, okay, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, meaning if anything is worth our worship, he says, think about such things. Love the Lord your God with all your minds. We could learn a lot from the Jews who believe that Sabbath, before they would gather for worship, began at sundown the evening before they actually came together. Can you imagine if we had that same attitude? That means uh, how we spend our Saturday evenings before we come to worship on Sunday would be radically different. Who we're with, what we watch, uh, what we say, where we go would be radically different. My daughter uh, is now uh, an adult. She's 32 years old, but uh, some of you remember when she was a, a baby. Um, but when she was about, about five years old, we took her to Disney World for the first time. We did the big reveal like all families do where you, you know, wait to tell her. And she was so excited. She'd seen all the videos, you know, the Disney videos. And so she had, for months, she was preparing for it. She actually... Uh, packed her bag and she had all of her clothes and we flew on the plane and she was first time for her to fly she was so excited we got to Orlando and got to the resort and the night before we were going to the park the next morning uh, she was uh, could not almost couldn't go to sleep because she was so excited she laid her clothes on the bed next to hers so she could jump in on the next morning like a firefighter going to a fire she woke up hours before it was time to go to the park she inhaled her breakfast, and we still had hours before the park even opened, and she's like, come on, let's go. Can't wait to get there. And when she got to the park, and, and we were there, and if you've been to Disney World or Disneyland, you know that you walk through the turnstiles of the gate, and you look down that road, and what do you see at the end of the road? The castle. If you've never been to Disney World, there's not really anything in the castle. It's just a, kind of this icon that sits there, so sorry to, to ruin that for you if you've never been. But she, she, she's at the castle, and she's like, come on, Mom, come on, Dad, let's go. She was so excited, and the reason she was so excited is because she had been thinking about it, dreaming about it, longing for it, looking for it. Her mind was so focused on it that she couldn't think of anything else. What if we had that same attitude about our worship together? Instead of waiting for the first song to determine whether we're going to engage or not that day, in worship. The Apostle Paul said this, that spiritual transformation occurs through the renewing of our minds. So when we offer our prayers and we read and listen to and study scripture texts, and we gather at the Lord's Supper table, and then we sing and play our songs, if we do that without engaging our minds and our intellect and our thinking, it can lead to thoughtless worship. Here's the fourth one that Jesus said. Worship also means we love God with all of our strength. All of our strength. Robert Weber, uh, one of my professors, actually said this. He, said, he actually wrote a book uh, about this too, that worship is a verb. So it's something we do, not something that's done for us. It's an action. When, when worship is a noun, then it becomes something we go to. 
But when it's a verb, it's something we do. You see the difference there? Paul wrote in Romans 12, 1, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, that you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Mitch Album uh, wrote a book uh, probably a couple of decades ago now called uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Uh, some of you may have read that or heard about that book. And I, I don't know what Mitch Album, where his faith uh, uh, life is, but uh, he had written a, a couple of things. And Tuesdays with Maury, he had a professor in college that was actually had, had terminal cancer, I think. And so he spent every Tuesday afternoon with him. And he wrote a book in response to that. One of the things that Mitch Album talked about was this understanding of sacrifice. And he says this, sometimes... When you sacrifice something precious, you're not really losing it. You're just passing it on to someone else. D.L. Moody was a famous preacher. And when we talk about this understanding of living sacrifice, one of the things that D.L. Moody used to say about living sacrifice is uh, that the problem with the living sacrifice is it just keeps crawling off the altar. So we have to understand this. Under, what, what does that actually mean to be a living sacrifice? Some of you will remember uh, um, Spires, Will, and Cecilia will probably remember too, um, Charlie Hawthorne. And some of you may know Charlie too or knew Charlie. Charlie was a member of our church at, at Pleasant View in Derby. And Charlie at, at that time, and I was the worship leader, and, and we, were, we were doing some newer things musically and and, but Charlie was a good friend, and Charlie would come by during the week and just drink coffee with me. And usually um, it was on, because we had all the rehearsals on Wednesday night, and usually it was on Wednesday afternoon when I had uh, still a half a day of work to do, and Charlie wanted to come by and just kind of shoot the breeze for half the day. And, so, but, and at the time, I thought, man, that's a distraction, but now I've realized that that was a divine appointment for me. That Charlie was one of those guys that, uh, man, if... if, if uh, if you just spend some time with him, he, was, he would be your best friend, and he was. He was, he was such a, a good, godly friend. And one time Charlie said to me, uh, he said, you know, I don't really like your music. Yeah, my music. I don't really like your music, but I like you. And if you think this is going to be the best thing to help, especially our young people, worship in spirit and in truth, then I'm all in. That's what it means to offer your body as a living sacrifice. That means you're landing more on deference instead of preference. I'm willing to defer because I want to see that next generation understand what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. Loving God with our strength means that we offer all of ourselves to him. Our physical strength, our abilities, our time, our talent. And if we're going to love God with all our strength, we have to be participators not spectators. Famous football coach, and some of you will not remember this name, but he was a, a famous football coach in years past, Don Shula. Don Shula used to say that you can't coach from the press box. You've got to be on the field. That's the understanding of not spectators. Spectators are those of us that come on Sunday morning, and, and we wait to see if we really like the songs before we'll actually engage. Participators are coming in, and they're saying, I don't care if I like the song or not. I'm going to worship in spirit and truth because I, it's more important to me to offer my body as a living sacrifice than it is to sing songs that I always like. Some of us in church life are like armchair quarterbacks. We like to complain about the coaching and refing at church, but we're not on the field, we're in the stands. There was a story that I read a while back that... Um, Navy and Fordham were playing each other in a football game in 2016. Navy and Fordham, those two teams were playing each other in 2016. And Navy had four quarterbacks. First string quarterback was going to be in the game. The second string quarterback um, was, uh, was there. But the third string quarterback uh, actually got suspended that week for, for whatever infraction or something like that. So they had two quarterbacks on the field. The fourth string quarterback was actually in the stands with the other midshipman in his dress, navy whites, so how they go to the football games, and he was in the stands. Well, a little ways into the game, the first string quarterback got hurt. He was out. So all they had left was a second string quarterback. So in the middle of the game, 
they had to actually pull the fourth string quarterback out of the stands and his uniform was not even at the field so they had to run back to the dorm to get his uniform so they could put him on the field in case the second string quarterback got hurt and by the fourth quarter Malcolm Perry fourth string quarterback at Navy was in the game didn't even have his uniform there so he was in the game now Malcolm Perry understood the difference between being in the stands and being in the game sometimes we sit in the stands as spectators and we observe or criticize instead of just locking in and saying I'm all in and again it's that understanding that worship sacrifice is only possible if our common ground is deference instead of preference I mentioned my dad earlier uh, my mom and dad my dad passed away three years ago um, the last 15 years of my life my um, uh, my dad's life he he was in a wheelchair for the last 15 years of his life my dad was a pretty avid golfer he retired early and so he was 75 years old played golf four days a week walked the course didn't ride still walked and pulled his, his cart and he was playing one day and got bit by a mosquito and contracted West Nile virus almost died spent 100 days in the hospital they weren't sure he was going to actually live um, and made, a, made a, a full mental recovery, but not a full physical recovery. So he spent the last 15 years of his life in, in a, a powered wheelchair. He still had enough arm strength that he could transfer himself in a chair and in the car. He couldn't drive. So my mom, who's the same age as my dad, um, when they went ever, anywhere, if they went to church or if they went to a restaurant or they, they went out to a store or anything like that, my dad in his powered chair would pull, pull it up to the, the side door of the car and open the door and he could transfer himself in. And then my mom, also the same age, would take that powered chair and wheel it around to the back of the car, strap it onto that lift, raise that up, get in and drive them there. And they would do the same thing in reverse when they got to the location. It didn't matter if it was raining or snowing or 100 degrees or 10 degrees. If they were going to go someplace, that's what they had to do. Now, if you were to ask my mother if it would have been her preference to spend the last 15 years of their married life, 63 years they were married, but the last 15 years of that, doing this, if that had been her preference, obviously the answer would have been no. But you see, my mom loved my dad more than she loved her preferences. So she was willing to sacrifice those preferences because she loved my dad more. So offering our bodies as living sacrifice or loving God with our strength means that those, those battle lines sometimes that happen in worship, instead of guarding territory, those battle lines are, are who can offer or give the most instead of who demands or deserves the most. I'm, I'm a big baseball fan. Baseball season's like eight days away. I mean, it's, it's here. And even if you're not a baseball fan, and I know, Gary, we played softball through the years, you understand this, that in baseball there, there are two sacrifices. There's a sacrifice fly and a bunt. And if you're not a baseball fan, you probably know this. The sole purpose of a bunt is to sacrifice yourself in order to advance another runner. And so you're willing to, to make an out to advance another runner. And they call that actually laying down a bunt. What a great picture of what it means to offer your body as a living sacrifice. It means you're willing to lay down those preferences because you love these people with whom you worship more than you love always getting your own way. We love God with all of our bodies, our souls, our minds, our strength. But then Jesus also says, worship means we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So worship is not just what we do in here. It's also who we are out there. Worship doesn't start with the first song and end with the closing song. Again, it's continuous. Eugene Peterson, in, in his book, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, said this. Worship is the primary means for forming us as participants in God's work. But if the blinds are drawn while we wait for Sunday, then we're not in touch with the work that God is actually doing. The second part of Jesus' commandment, he says, is, is just as great as the first. He said that, 
that uh, loving your neighbor as you love yourself is equal to those other things of loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. So it doesn't matter how good our worship is in here, it's incomplete until it also includes how we treat our neighbors out there. Several years ago, I read an article by Ron Edmondson. Ron's a pastor and an author. And he'd written this article, and the title of the article is, When Did Christians Become So Mean? And here's what he said. Uh, and he, he said a lot of things in the article, but one thing that really stood out, out to me, he said that he, he interviewed some uh, restaurant servers. And he asked the servers of, you know, it, it wasn't a baited question. He's just like, you know, when's the best time for tips and uh, attitudes of people? When, you know, when is the best time to serve And they said the worst time for service was what they call the church hour. Which is the hour that all the churches let out and go to the restaurants. They said that is the worst time for tips and condescending attitudes. When did Christians become so mean? So even how we treat our restaurant server is an act of worship. A number of years ago at Pleasant View Derby, again, we would always rehearse on uh, like a Saturday morning before a big Christmas production. So this, this particular year, and Stan, you'll understand this too, um, we had one final rehearsal before we were doing the presentation the next day. It was a Saturday morning. Um, the, the choir and orchestra were on the platform. We were rehearsing in the worship center. So I, it was a platform like this, worship center out here. Choir and orchestra were like back here. So my back would have been to the chairs or the pews at that time. It was a Saturday morning. Nobody else was in the church except the, the choir and orchestra. And we were rehearsing there. We had a, about three hours of rehearsal scheduled with about four hours of stuff that had to be done. So I, there, there was no levity. I mean, we were, I was trying to keep them on, on task. <clears throat> about halfway through the rehearsal... I could tell the choir and orchestra were distracted by something. And so I'm thinking, great, you know, something's, good, something's keeping their attention. We've got to keep focused here because we've got to get this done for tomorrow night. And so I, I was rehearsing them like this, and I turned around, and I saw that a guy had come in the back of the worship center. I could tell by the way he was dressed that he had some needs. And I could tell that, that the reason he was probably there that particular morning was for benevolent need. And so I, I thought, okay, I'm going to have to deal with this quickly so I can get back to rehearsal. So I met him about halfway back. And he said, uh, my, I've just recently lost my job. Um, it's Christmas time. We have some needs. We just, you know, food and gas and some of those things. But also, we, we would love just to be able to get our kids some Christmas presents. Do you think your church could help? Here's my response. We're right in the middle of getting ready for a worship service tomorrow night. And, and we don't have a lot of time to rehearse, to get ready for that. So if you'll come back on Monday, we'll try to help you. See, in that moment, I was more concerned about preparing for a worship service that is going on tomorrow night than being the church in worship and service in that moment. I wonder what our worship could have been like if I had modeled for our choir and orchestra what it mean, meant to actually love the Lord our God and our neighbor as ourselves in that moment. I, I don't know if it radically changed our worship, but I can imagine it may have. See, sometimes we're more concerned with doing church than actually being the church in some of those instances. So we must lead and model and teach the church to worship not only when we gather, but also when we disperse. Mark Laberton wrote this. He wrote a book called Dangerous Act of Worship. It's it's an excellent book. I'd encourage you to read this. He says this. Worship can name a Sunday gathering of God's people, but it also includes how we treat those around us, how we spend our money, how we care for the lost and the oppressed, because worship encompasses every dimension of our lives. Loving our neighbor is an act of worship means that worship is not just a weekly event. It's a daily occurrence. Again, worship is continuous. 
So our, our theology of worship, our worship understanding is shallow if our only worship voice is that one hour on Sunday while ignoring the other 167 hours of the week. Some of you remember the Tom Hanks movie, Castaway. You remember he was on a deserted island. He, got, he was on the FedEx plane or something that crashed. And he, he was out there by himself for a long time. And he started to look. He opened up those packages trying to find things that would uh, allow him to survive. And he, remember he was on this deserted island. It was hot and all that. And he found an ice skate, you know, to, to help him with some things. And some things he absolutely didn't need. But one of the things he realized early in the movie, he realized that, that if he didn't create fire... It was going to be hard for him to survive. And so we get to see a glimpse of Tom Hanks in this movie trying to find a way to actually start a fire from scratch. And so he, his hands are blistered by the time he finally gets this little bit of kindling going and he, he adds some brush to it. And pretty soon he's, he's got this raging fire and he's dancing around. You've, if you haven't seen the movie, he's dancing around the fire because he's so excited about that. But he tried to start that fire from a single spark. Kind of sounds like Sunday worship sometimes. Because we gather together expecting our worship leaders to light a fire from scratch with the opening song. And if that fire is not ignited, we blame the music or the musicians. And then we sometimes then leave the service believing that worship couldn't and didn't occur. Even though we did nothing individually. To stir those embers during the week. Early nomadic people, because of the laborious task of creating fire, realized how difficult it was because they were nomadic. They realized how difficult it was to move from camp to camp almost every day and then create a fire from scratch every time they, they made a new camp, broke camp, and went to another camp. And so what early nomadic people did... They actually created this earthenware, earthenware vessel called a fire pot. And so what they would do in the morning before they left the camp and before they would go to those, the, the other location, and they were nomadic, so they were constantly on the move, they would take that fire pot and put some of the kindling from that fire that was still, uh, those embers were still there, and then somebody was responsible throughout the day to continue to feed a little kindling to that to keep that, those embers burning. So when they got to the new camp, all they had to do was put those embers in there, add a little bit more kindling, kindling and a little bit of breeze, and they pretty well, pretty soon had a, a raging fire. So what if we as a church had that same attitude and understanding of worship? That we saw it not as a flame that we take, uh, sorry, not as a flame or, or, uh, that we have to start every week, but as a flame that we can take with us. Meaning it, 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 would, it would leave with us at the end of the service. That means the worship could happen in our homes when we go home. At school, when you go back to school. It could happen in our workplace. So then worship wouldn't be contained in a single location or context or culture or style or artistic expression, or vehicle of communication. Then when we gathered on Sunday for worship as the body, instead of depending on our worship leaders to start that fire from scratch, all they would need to do is just fan those flames of those embers that were already burning. And can you imagine, can you imagine what kind of worship could occur in our gathered worship if we as Christ followers understood what it mean, meant to worship in scattered worship too. Sunday worship would be an overflow of that worship that's been happening throughout the entire week. Can you imagine what that could be for a congregation? Jesus combined our love for God and our love for others. He said they're inseparable worship actions. Worship isn't just our response to God's revelation through the songs we sing on Sunday, but it's also our response through the rhythms and harmonies of life on Monday, too. And that, that understanding actually should cause us to worship differently. And if it doesn't, we've wasted an opportunity. So loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, worship, that understanding of worship, 
must spring forth from every aspect of our being or it may not be worship at all. Let me pray for you and then, Jason, you can come up. God, thank you for this church. I know that they're a worshiping congregation. It's just such a blessing on a Wednesday night to see this crowd here. And thank you for your, the pastors that serve so faithfully here and, and a church that loves to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, even tonight, I pray as we leave this place that we'll take that spark, understanding and worship with us. And then as we gather back on Sunday, what occurs will be an overflow of what's already been happening throughout the week. Father, help us to start thinking more about continuous worship. And that every aspect of our being is a response to what you've already done in our lives. Thank you that we get to do this. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thanks. David.